Hare Krishna. Jai Radha Madhava Kunja Bihari Jai Radha Madhava Kunja Bihari Gopi Janabala Bhagiri Bharadhari Gopi Janabala Bhagiri Bharadhari Yashoda Nandana Braja Janaran Janha Yashoda Nandana Braja Janaran Janha Yamuna Tiravanachari Yamuna Tira Vanachari Jai Haradha Madhava Kunja Bihari Jaya Radha Madhava Kunja Bihari Gopi Janabala Bhagiri Bharadhari Gopi Janabala Bhagiri Bharadhari Yashoda Nandana Praja Janaranjanha Yashoda Nandana Braja Janaran Janha Yamuna Tira Vanachari Yamuna Tira Vanachari Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Oh. 
Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Premanande Om Magyana Timarandasya Gyananjana Shalakaya Chaksurun Militanyena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Shri Chaitanya Mano Bistam Stapitam Yena Bhutale Swayam Rupakadhamayam Dadati Swapadantikam Bandeham Shri Gara Shri Yata Pada Kamalam Shri Gurun Vaishnavamscha Shri Rupam Sakrajatam Sahagana Raganathan Vitam Tam Sajevam Sadvaitam Savadutam Parijana Sahitam Krishna Chaitanya Devam Shri Radha Krishna Padan Sahagana Lalita Shri Vishaka Nitamscha He Krishna Karana Sindhu Dinabandhu Jagatpate Gopesha Gopika Kanta Radha Kanta Namastate Tapta Kanchana Gorange Radhe Vrindavanishwari Vrishabhanu Sute Devi Pranamami Hari Priye Vancha Kaupatarubhyascha Kripa Sindhu Bhai Evacha Patita Nam Pavane Bhyo Vaishnavibhyo Namo Nama Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prashtaya Bhutale Shrimati Bhakti Vedanta Swaminiti Namane Namaste Sarasati Devi Koravani Precharine Nirvisesha Shunyavadi Paschatya Desatarine Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Hatvaita Gadadhar Shri Vasade Gaur Bhaktavinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare So today is the auspicious day of Guru Purnima. We want to dedicate this time this evening to glorify our founder Acharya, His Divine Grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Srila Prabhupada. Srila Prabhupada, of course, is spiritual master, the founder Acharya of our society. So in that sense, all of you have a relationship with Srila Prabhupada. He is the Shiksha Guru for all the devotees. That's very important for us to understand Srila Prabhupada's relationship with the devotees. We may think, oh no, no, I'm I'm the disciple of some other person, the disciples of Srila Prabhupada. But it's Srila Prabhupada who is the Shiksha Guru, and he's a prominent guru for the whole society. 
And new people who come to our movement, they're encouraged also, they're, they're encouraged to take shelter of Srila Prabhupada. Those of you who don't have a spiritual master yet, who are not initiated, you should begin by taking shelter of Srila Prabhupada. And those of us who are, who are initiated, we take initiation with the intention that it will bring us closer to Srila Prabhupada, that we all have a relationship with Srila Prabhupada. We want to understand not only Srila Prabhupada, but all the parampara, the, all the acharyas. You can see here on the wall at the back here, we have the five acharyas from this, uh, our society. To, uh, we have Srila Prabhupada's spiritual master, Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasati, and then his spiritual master, Gorkishore Das Babaji. And then Gorky Shodas Babaji, he was a Shiksha disciple of Bhakti Vinod, and Bhakti Vinod Thakur was a Shiksha disciple of Jagannath Das Babaji. So in that sense, the parampara, it's not so much based on Diksha, but it's more based on Shiksha. It's Shiksha which is important. And everyone needs to, we need to get instruction. So Srila Prabhupada, knew that when he began our Krishna consciousness movement, he knew that he, he was already in old age. So he wanted to write books, and he knew the books were very important for the foundation for our Krishna conscious society. And this is one thing which we have, that you know so many other societies are there, but nobody has books like what we have. They have books, of course, they also have books, but they don't have such auth authoritative scriptures as we have, with word-for-word -word translation and commentaries by not only Srila Prabhupada, but commentaries given by all the acharyas. So Srila Prabhupada labored for us to prepare these books. You know, he would wake up in the... Well, first of all, Srila Prabhupada greatly reduced his eating and sleeping. He said when he was a young man, he, he gave up eat, uh, he gave up mating and defending. When he was a young man, he gave up mating and defending. He, he was married, he had a family, he had five children, but then, you know, what, when he was not very old, he already had children, so he gave up mating and defending. He was not possessive. And then he said in his old age, he'd also given up eating and sleeping. He would practically reduced his eating and sleeping to nothing. Like the Goswamis, we're chanting every morning, Goswami Astikam, how the Goswamis conquered over eating and sleeping, and they were always meek and humble, engaged in remembering the transcendental pastimes of the divine couple, Radha and Krishna. So Srila Prabhupada was in that mood. He was a kinchana. We have been talking of prayers by Queen Kunti, and Queen Kunti has been explaining to us how the Lord is the property of those who are materially impoverished. Namo nivrita kinchaye, right? Namo nivrita kinchana. So Srila Prabhupada, he was in that condition. He, he would quote the verse from Srimad Bhagavatam. There's a famous verse in the 10th canto. It's in the 88th chapter, and it's the 8th sloka. <laughs> it's very interesting. These very important verses, you often find that they're, they're in a, you know, the, the slokas and the chapter numbers are easy to remember for us. It's like Srila Vyasadeva compiled these books in such a manner just to make it easier for us to memorize. So, 10th 
tenth canto means the pastimes of Lord Krishna. And the 88th chapter is describing about how uh, Lord Shiva defeat, he was attacked by Vritasura. But at the beginning of the chapter, there's a discussion between Lord Krishna and Maharaj Yudhisthira. Maharaj Yudhisthira was asking the Lord, he said, you know, why is it the devotees of Lord Shiva, they can worship Lord Shiva and they get so much material facilities, they're given so much opulence. We often see those who are Shivites, they enjoy the material world. They have a lot of luxury, a lot of opulence. But the devotees of Lord Narayan, the devotees of the personality of Godhead, they're not so fortunate. They're often impoverished. They lose their wealth. Why is it like that? Maharaj Yudhisthira was asking to Lord Krishna. So Lord Krishna explained to him, he said, Yashyaham anugranami harishetad danam shanai. It's a very significant verse. And Srila Prabhupada quoted this verse himself in relation to his own life. Because Srila Prabhupada said, he said, initially, he said, my thinking was, I will do business and I will make money. And with money, I will give it to my Guru Maharaj for his preaching. He thought, I will, I will, my business will make a lot of money and I will give the money for my guru so he can use it for the preaching. But it didn't happen like that. Prabhupada said, actually, astrologer had told him, he said, you're going to be one of the richest men in India. He said, you have a lot of wealth in your chart. And Prabhupada said when he was a young man, of course he met Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasati when he was like 25 years old. That, that was the first meeting at Ulta Danga. So he met Bhakti Siddhanta and Bhakti Siddhanta said, you are a nice young man, why don't you preach the message of Lord Chaitanya? And Prabhupada said, I, I could not take up the order at that time because you know well I said just married and children had some children already they were young so I couldn't really just give up everything and go off and preach but he said I was impressed anyway Prabhupada was thinking I, I will do business and he said this business at one point was quite successful and he was making quite good money but then Somehow, gradually, the business failed. Some different people cheated him. Something happened. The business just failed. And gradually, you know, he ended, had to close down the business. And then when there's no money, so long as the money was there, you know, the family were okay. But when the business went down and the, there was less money, then there was problems and the family members were no longer so nice. They didn't have the same respect anymore. And even the servants were not very nice. And so Prabhupada understood that this was special arrangement of Krishna. Try to understand that a devotee of Krishna doesn't have karma. It's not karma because he surrendered to Krishna. He surrendered to Krishna so the karma is all finished. You know there's different stages of karma. We've got the parabdha karma. We can see the, our material bodies. That's parabdha karma. You can see the karma. And there's aparabdha karma. The karma which is not yet manifest, it's coming, it's not yet coming. But it's, it's there, but it's not manifest yet. 
And then there's other stages, there's something called kuta, means it's about to come. And there's also bija, the seed of karma. Different stages of karma. So devotional service is so powerful, it burns up all this karma, right? Brahma Samhita says, yes, vendra gopa mata vendra aho swa karma bandha nirupa Yes, karmani evati nirvati, karmani evati nirvati atman. It, that, that the devotion burns up all the karma. It's all taken away by devotion. So when Prabhupada got the difficulties and lost the business, lost the money, it wasn't karma. It was the arrangement of Krishna. You have to see that. Devotees devotees who've surrendered their life to Krishna and then things happen maybe you lose your job or you somebody gets ill or some it's the arrangement of Lord Krishna he arranges these things and there's a reason by it, it Lord Krishna is telling Maharaj Yudhisthira he said y yes he said um, he said that Harishi, I take away from them all their dhanam, all their wealth. I take all their wealth. He said, when I favor someone, yashyahamanugrinami, harishi taddhanam shanai. When I favor someone, I take away their opulence. And he said, in that helpless condition, their family and relatives, they reject him. And in this way he suffers. Right? But that suffering which Prabhupada went through is not ordinary. That this is the arrangement of Lord Krishna. In th in this verse, the Acharyas explain that they give different examples. They say now you, we may say, why would Krishna make his devotees suffer? Well, they give one example. They say, just like the young be young boys, they go to school. The young boy may say, "Oh, Pita, no, I don't want to go to school. No, I don't want to go. Don't send me to school." But the father said, "No, you go to school. You have to go, right? Why? Father knows. Son has to get education. Good for him." Son saying, oh no, daddy, no, teachers are nasty, you know, they, they pull your ear, they beat you, oh no. But the father says, no, you have to go. You have to get education. The same way, material world, we have to go through the difficulties. Because these difficulties, they help us to approach Lord Krishna with more feeling than we could normally have. If we just have a comfortable life, then it's very difficult for Lord Krishna to have a place in the life of the person. We need these difficulties. Another example is given. Just like sometimes you may, you may injure your, yourself. Maybe you're playing football or something and you get a graze on your skin and they will come and they will put some disinfectant on it. When you put the disinfectant, it stings. Oh, oh, you put that disinfectant on it, you feel the sting. But that sting is a sign that it's killing the disease and it's going to make it healthy. Or you have an eye infection and they put the ointment in the eye and you feel it sting, but that helps the eye to get healthy cured of the infection. So the same way, the difficulties, the pain which we have in the material world, they're good for us. They help us to approach Krishna with more feeling, without the attachment to the material things. Right? We have to become a kinchana. 
we have to become free of these material attachments. And Srila Prabhupada experienced this. Krishna took away everything from him. Even in Calcutta, when he was doing business, he had a car, he was, dry, he, was, he was opulent, but then he lost everything gradually. And he understood that mercy of Lord Krishna is coming. Krishna said, when I favor someone, I take away all of their wealth. And in that helpless condition, then they can come to the Lord with more feeling. It's important that Krishna does like this. Because then those people who are not very faithful, they will be afraid. They will say, no, I'm not going to worship Krishna. He will take away everything from me. I don't want to worship Krishna. So people who don't have much faith, they won't come to Krishna. Krishna wants people who have full faith. And those who have full faith, then they will experience the real wealth. Krishna takes away the things which are not very necessary to give something which is more valuable. Prabhupada explained, he said, at home I had my wife and a few children and a little home. But Krishna took everything away and then Prabhupada went to preach and instead of just having one home with a few children, he got homes all over the world with children who loved him much more than his own children. The disciples, the devotees were much more loving and caring for Prabhupada than his own children. So Prabhupada saw Krishna would take away things to give something much more valuable. And this is the special arrangement of Krishna. Try to understand. Srila Prabhupada experienced this in his own life. He had to endure difficulties. He had to struggle. He went to Vrindavan. He went to Vrindavan, of course, and then he took his sannyas, and then he got gored by a bull. He was in the, st he was in the streets in Vrindavan, and a, a bull gored him. He was badly injured. He had to. He was on his back for a quite several many days, and no one was, no one was there to care for him. And so he was certain. Certainly, when these things happen, we'll think. Oh, I've made, I've done, I've done the wrong thing. I shouldn't have gone, I shouldn't have taken the sannyas, I shouldn't have left home. But he had that determination. He remained steady, he remained fixed, and he went on with his mission. And then he went to the U.S., and again in the U.S., it was struggle. There were so many hardships. At one point, he got everything stolen. There's a lot of thieves in New York. He was living in New York, and he had some typewriter, and he was type typing his manuscript for the Bhagavad Gita. And somehow, at some point, somebody came. They stole everything. Prabhupada lost his manuscript. He had to write the whole thing again. He had to tolerate so much inconvenience. He could have thought, oh, I will just give up. Oh, it's too difficult. But he, he remained very determined that he wanted to do this service for Krishna. Right? Lord Krishna said, don't be attached to the results. Lord Nityananda also went for preaching. Lord Nityananda went to Jagai and Madhai. On the first attempt, they failed. Lord Nityananda and Haridas, they were chased by Jagai and Madai. They had to run to save their life. But Lord Nityananda came back and tried again. And second time, of course, he was injured. He was hit on the head with a wine pot. 
and Lord Chaitanya was very angry, but Lord Nityananda remained merciful and prayed to Lord Chaitanya to forgive them. And Jaghai and Madhai surrendered. So examples are there that difficulties will come. Prahlad Maharaj had so many difficulties. Dhruva Maharaj went through difficulties. Maharaj Yudhisthira and the Pandavas had so many difficulties. They had so many troubles. We, we talked about them in previous nights. The house of Shilak set on fire, the poison food given to them, and the cannibals, and then tried to take their wife away and ruin the chastity of Draupadi. So many different issues were there, so many threats. But they remained loyal, they remained steady in their devotion to Lord Krishna. And they continued. In the same way, Srila Prabhupada had to tolerate so many difficulties, but he never gave up the struggle. He would give the example sometimes, he would say, just like in India, he said, the train, the railway, you know, the trains on the Indian railway, they're not very punctual. He said, they have the, the saying in the Indian railway, keep the wheels rolling that even the train cannot go very fast. Nowadays it's much better, but in, at least, you know, in the past, you know, Prabhupada's time especially, you know, <laughs> the, the, trains, the trains are coming not very punctual. But they keep coming. They don't stop. So he said like that. He said, keep the wheels rolling. Even you're not going very fast, but keep the wheels rolling. Keep trying to go forward. So Prabhupada did like that. He kept trying, he kept trying to go forward, try to go forward, go forward. Sent devotees around different places. He sent different devotees to different parts of the world, go there, open up a center. And in some cases it worked, but not every case. Like Prabhupada sent devotees in the beginning, somebody he sent Upendra, a devotee called Upendra, to Australia. And he started the Australian Yatra. They went there with no money, with no books, but, the, but they went where, with their faith in Prabhupada. And they went there and they made devotees and they got people chanting and Prabhupada went there and now they have wonderful temples. So Prabhupada had that vision that Krishna's there, Krishna can help. It doesn't depend on material facilities, but it depends on faith and that enthusiasm and conviction. And Prabhupada had that to the greatest e extent. He was always ready to go to different places and to meet people and to preach. He went, he went to Malaysia in 1971. He went to Malaysia. You can read the book. There's a small book written on it, Prabhupada coming to Malaysia. And it describes how Prabhupada came there. There were a few devotees. He'd, he'd been refused entry in Singapore. Singapore was one of the places. They wouldn't let Prabhupada in because somehow they knew that Prabhupada was the head of Hare Krishna and Hare Krishna go in the street and they sing and dance <laughs> and they just sell books to people. And so they said, we don't want you in Singapore. No, you can't come here. So he couldn't get into Singapore. <coughs> and for, for many, many, many years, we haven't been able to go into Singapore. We have to kind of undercover incognito, try to develop the Singapore preaching. And so Prabhupada couldn't get into Singapore. He came to Malaysia and devotees were there. Then he came to Ke Kuala Lumpur. And he spent some time, he told the devotees there, you sh it, he asked one Indian family, you should build a temple. He requested them build a temple. <laughs> the people, the they, they were a little shocked. They didn't, not too eager. 
what Prabhupada was indicating. Uh, we need temple, we should have a temple here. Although it's a not a, it's an Islamic country, but still there's a percentage of people and there's some religious freedom there. They allow the people to practice their other religions. Although they're not Islamic, they're allowed to practice. And so Prabhupada was there, he was preaching there. He traveled by car with no air conditioning, no highways in those days, you know, very laborious. And they, when he got there, after traveling many hours in the car, the devotee said, Oh, Prabhupada, you've been traveling for hours. You should take a rest. Prabhupada said, I've taken so much trouble to come here. Now let me preach. He didn't want to rest. He said, after spend, I've spent so many hours to come here. I'm not just going to rest. He said, let me preach. It was his life. He was very eager address the world and to teach Krishna consciousness. When we had Prabhupada come in England, I was there in London. I, I got my initiation in 1971 from Srila Prabhupada. So that's more than 50 years ago. At that time, we had a very small yatra. We were renting one house in London. But we had deities. We have the we had the Radha Landanishwara deities were installed, and we were about I think it was about eighteen of us staying in the temple. There were a couple of ladies. One was French, one was American, and that that was when I first came. Later on, you know that many people joined. We had many more and more people were joining all the time. And the movement was expanding rapidly. So that was when George Harrison, he purchased the Bhaktivedanta Manor because we were, we were so many devotees living in a, a small house. Anyway, Srila Prabhupada, uh, he would come every year to visit us. Usually when we had Rathiyatra, he liked to come. And I remember he came for Janmashtami there also. And he came. What happened was there was one devotee came from America. Like there was one devotee from the USA. He had come because in the USA they were doing very good Sankirtan. They were distributing a lot of books. So they wanted to encourage us in England that we could also distribute books. So they sent one or two of the men from the USA to come and show us and train us up how to distribute Prabhupada's books. And so one devotee came, the one, the older one who was in charge, he came and, and we had one room for Prabhupada. The house, it, it, it was, it, in, you can see the house, it's still there in London. It's near to the British Museum. And it's only like 10 minutes walk from Soho Street, from the present temple in London. It's at a place called Number 7 Bury Place. And it's like five floors. There's a basement, which was the prasadam room, and the kitchen was there in the basement also. And then the temple was on the ground floor. And Prabhupada's room was the floor above the temple. And then above that, we had uh, the ladies' ashram, and then above that, then there was a couple more floors for the men. And the office also had to be there somewhere. So we were living like that. And each of the rooms, the, each area, it was not very big. It was you know, kind of a small area. But it, we were living there, and the house was rented. And uh, people were coming. And we had this one room for Prabhupada. But the devotee came from America. And he saw the room and he said, oh, he said, I don't think Prabhupada should stay here. And he wrote to Prabhupada. He wrote to Srila Prabhupada and he said, Srila Prabhupada, he said, when you come to England next time, we want to rent a suite in the hotel for you. Because the temple is quite small here and your room is not really very big. But when you come next time, we will rent a nice suite for you in a nearby hotel. But Prabhupada wrote back to him and said, I don't want to stay in the hotel. 
I want to stay in the temple. He said, I like that room. <laughs> so this was try to understand Srila Prabhupada's mood, you know, that uh, w we were all, of course, we were delighted when we heard Srila Prabhupada say like this. It, it really meant a lot to us to know how much Prabhupada uh, cared to be with the devotees and to live with the devotees. You know, he, he didn't mind a little bit inconvenience, but he was ready to accept so much inconvenience for the service of Krishna. And he, he would come like that every year. He would come to England and he would stay. Later on, of course, a year or two later, George Harrison purchased the Bhaktivedanta Manor. And if you see the rooms there for Prabhupada, very beautiful, very spacious, very nicely maintained. And, and that's the custom around the world if you go to different centers like if you go to Zurich and like that in Switzerland they ha have a nice temple there they have a beautiful room for Srila Prabhupada although Srila Prabhupada I don't think he ever went there to that temple in Zurich but they have one room which is Srila Prabhupada's room and they have a murti of Srila Prabhupada there and they have the room very nicely decorated and maintained in honor of Srila Prabhupada. So like that we, we, we preserve the tradition of honoring Srila Prabhupada as the founder Acharya. And that's why every morning we do also Guru Puja. Let everyone can take part in Prabhupada's Guru Puja. He can offer flowers to Prabhupada. Srila Prabhupada liked us to always be at the temple program. You know, he would he would like to go for a walk in the morning, but he would always come back in time for the deity greeting. And he considered himself to be the servant of the deities. He didn't think the deities are there to serve me. He say, I am the servant of the deities. He would always come back in time for the deity greeting and then he would give his class on Srimad Bhagavatam. He would preach to us usually in the morning Srimad Bhagavatam and in the evening Bhagavad Gita. And this was his regular program. And during the night he would wake up and write his books. And sometimes the devotees had the job, you know, different times would be the night watchman. Somebody has to be the guard, night guard. Nobody should disturb Srila Prabhupada. And Srila Prabhupada would get up about midnight and begin writing for a few hours. And then morning, he'd go out for morning walk. He, he liked to be in the temple and to hear what was going on. He always was aware of what was going on. I had the experience I was in Vrindavan, Krishna Balaram Mandir. It was about 1976. So th at that time, you know, 50 years ago in Vrindavan, it's very different from what it is today. And our Krishna Balaram temple is out from the main part from the Loi Bazaar. And there was not so many buildings and not so many shops and not so much traffic on the roads at that time. So the temple was quite quiet. So it came to midday arti. The midday arti, the, they were doing the arti, pujaris came out, blew the conch shell and everything, and there was only a few people in the temple room. So I was there, so I picked up the kartals and I started to lead the kirtan. And five minutes after the I began the kirtan, the arti is going on, and the Prabhupada's secretary, it was a sannyasi, he came out and he said to me, Prabhupada wants to know, why is nobody playing Madanga? <laughs> it, it's really, really amazing. You know, Prabhupada was in his room, which is a house behind the temple. And I was in the temple room, it's quite a big sized temple, you know, and I wasn't using a microphone or anything. 
but somehow Prabhupada heard, he was listening, and he heard, he could tell, nobody's playing the madanga. And he sent somebody, he sent a devotee, he sent the sannyasi over. Prabhupada said, must have somebody play the madanga. Whenever there's kirtan, there must be madanga and kartals. <laughs> so that was uh, one instruction came directly from Prabhupada which I got. Another instruction was, I was with Prabhupada, it was 1977 and Prabhupada's health was not good. He was bedridden. He was on his back and uh, he wanted kirtan. He wanted devotees all the time kirtan. Not big kartals but very tiny kartals and just kartals, you know, we weren't playing madanga then that time. Temple room, he wanted madanga and kartals, but for his own room, you, know, you just play kartals, little kartals. And he was li laying there, resting and hearing kirtan. He wanted to hear kirtan constantly. The Devotees were constantly having kirtan for him. So at one point, I got to go in to do kirtan with another devotee. We were both brahmacharis at the time and we went in and offered our obeisances and started to do kirtan for Prabhupada. So this one devotee who was with me, he was in, from USA, he was leading the kirtan and he was chanting Hare Krishna first of all, began with Hare Krishna. At a certain point he changed and he started to sing Govinda Jai Jai and Prabhupada immediately opened his eyes and said, just chant Hare Krishna. <laughs> so that was another instruction we got from Prabhupada. How Prabhupada constantly guiding us, giving us instructions, everything. He was checking everything. When we would cook prasadam, whatever was being distributed for the festivals and for the programs, let me see, what are you distributing? What are the guests getting? He would check it out, he wanted to see. And sometimes he would also complain. He would, sometimes he would tell the devotees, this is terrible. <laughs> he would let them know, you know, if it was no good. He had very clear standards what he wanted, you know. And he was always checking on us to make sure that we did everything nicely. I remember one time it was in London. We were, uh, well, we were getting the altar ready for the deity greeting, and it was a bit of a rush, you know, usual <laughs> rush. Try to because, you know, the Mongol Arti four thirty, five o'clock, and then by seven or seven thirty, then the deity greet. So you've got to bathe the deities, you've got to change the dress and put everything and get everything done ready, exactly on time. Everything had to be on time. Prabhupada was very punctual and he expected us always to keep that punctuality. So uh, you can, y even y in Vrindavan there was this bell, you know, they'd ring the bell every hour and and Prabhupada was very conscious if they didn't ring the bell. In the middle of the night, if they didn't ring the bell, he would call the secret he'd call his secretary in the middle and he said he would say to the secretary, Do you hear it? The secretary said, No, Prabhupada, I don't hear it. Prabhupada said, Yes. You know what that means? He's sleeping. Go outside and wake him up. Tell him ring the bell. <laughs> Your night watchman is sleeping. So Prabhupada was always, you know, so conscious of everything. Always going around the temple, checking everything. So uh, what was I was telling about the punctuality, getting everything ready. Oh yeah, in London, that time, we were getting the altar ready and we rushed to get, somehow we put the pictures, the parampara, we got them the wrong way. <laughs> you know, sometimes, you know, I got, it, maybe we're, I was a new devotee. I, was it me? I can't remember if it was me or somebody. Anyway, somebody put the pictures the wrong way. Maybe 
Gorkishore and Bak Jagannath Das Babaji sometimes easily get mixed up, you know, who's who. Anyway, Prabhupada noticed, look at this, this is wrong, who's done this? <laughs> you know? Very conscious. He said, am I the only one to see these things? Don't, and he would say to the managers, you know, he said, don't you notice these things, don't you see? Am I the only one to see this? Like this, he was always training us. Everything had to be just right, how he wanted everything. And the, the, then the deities also. We had, uh, on the bottom, we had Radha Landanishwara. And because the temple was very narrow, there was no space, you know, you've got a big wide room here. But in London that time, we had a very narrow temple. So we had Radha Landanishwara, and we had Jagannath above. They put a whole platform there, with Jagannath Baladev Subhadra up on top, which was okay, Prabhupada accepted that. But what happened was, you know, we'd put a lot of flowers all around Radha Landanishwara. We didn't have any flowers around Jagannath. And Prabhupada said, why all this here and nothing there? <laughs> oh, you know, I, everything had to be very perfect, you know, he would check everything. And he, he would tell us. And then uh, he would check the accounts also. Because in the UK, you know, we, of course we're a, a registered society there. We'd registered with the charity commissions and we had tax exemption. And that same tax exemption which we had in London, later on that was introduced to India. And that's how we have tax exemption in, in, in India also. And that's very important to have that kind of uh, status that you get tax exemption. So Prabhupada was also very concerned that in London we had good accounting. It's a big job, accounting, you know, especially devotees sometimes, you know. They want money, but then when you ask them, where's the receipts? Oh, I lost, oh, no, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. So many things. But Prabhupada was always very concerned, you must, must keep good accounts, everything must be done nicely. And Prabhupada taught us how to do the accounting. That whatever money comes in, whatever income, goes in the bank. It must first be deposited in the bank. And then expenses you take out from the bank. And he said this way then you have uh, accounts. He said everything is there, it's all recorded in the bank, with the bank. So Prabhupada was very particular in training devotees for all these things. At the same time, his whole bu his real heart was in writing and preaching. In London, he liked to meet important people, and he wanted that. He said, uh, he said, it bring some different, a prominent man in society to meet him, and he would preach to them. And so the devotees would do like that. They brought many different important people to meet Prabhupada. Sometimes they were newspaper reporters. They were, that was common to get newspaper reporters. They would come and interview Srila Prabhupada. Because gurus were very much in the news at that time. There were many gurus and Hare Krishna was a new movement. It was a new thing in England. And the devotees were being seen in the public places, on the street, every day. And so Srila Prabhupada was their leader. He was their representative. And so they would come and meet Prabhupada and qu question him. And you can see a number of these interviews have been published. Books like Science of Self-Realization and other books like that different interviews, different conversations between Srila Prabhupada and different prominent men. Srila Prabhupada loved to talk to people and tell them about Krishna consciousness. But he would also talk about common things. One time at Bhaktivedanta Manor, you know, George Harrison had purchased the Bhaktivedanta Manor. There was one gardener who was taking care of the different plants and trees and things like that. So when we took over the Bhaktivedanta Manor, that gardener was still there and he, he was taking care of the grounds. And so Prabhupada was talking to him 
and uh, the gardener was telling Srila Prabhupada, he said, he said, all my teeth are false. He said, because I like sweets. He said, I, I eat a lot of sweets, so I've lost all my teeth and I have all false teeth. So Prabhupada said to him, he said, I also like sweets, but he said, I have all of my teeth. He said, I eat milk sweets. <laughs> if you eat milk sweets, it's different from, you know, this, what, the, what this gardener had been eating, you know, and the karmi, <laughs> toffee, these kind of things. But Prabhupada said, if you eat milk sweets, you, you can keep your teeth. <laughs> so Prabhupada always liked us to make milk sweets. And of course, Mongol Arti, we would offer milk sweets to the deities. And if you go to temples like uh, Juhu and Vrindavan and London, you'll see every morning they offer milk sweets, many varieties of milk sweets to the deities at Mongol Arti time. And uh, then these sweets are distributed. Uh, one time in Los Angeles, the devotees had made a sweet for Prabhupada, but they used chocolate. They made some chocolate kind of sweet. And Srila Prabhupada said, what is this? <laughs> you know, Prabhupada did not like it at all. He didn't like concoct concocted things. He said, he said, who taught you to make this? He said, I have taught you to make other Bengali sweets. Why can't you make the sweets I taught you? <laughs> Prabhupada taught devotees to make things like rasgulla and sandesh and burfi. <laughs> these, he, he liked these kind of things. Bengali sweets, you know, milk sweets. He th just to use these western concoctions, chocolate and whatever. He said, this is not, for, not so good for offering to Krishna. He liked us to offer things to Krishna which are Vedic. The Vedic standard, you know. So Prabhupada liked to do things like that. He was, he was particular. Uh, there, there were many incidents with Prabhupada. Uh, at, at, at initiation, when we had initiation with Prabhupada, he, he wouldn't interview us beforehand. Usually. You know, like when I was initiated, we never met Prabhupada, but it was initiation. We would sit there, and one by one, they would call us forward to come in front of Prabhupada. And then Prabhupada would say, so, offer obeisances, and then make sure, say the pranam mantra aloud. He wanted to hear that at least you know the pranam mantra. <laughs> Maybe you don't know very much, but at least you know the pranam mantra. So we would say Prabhupada's pranam mantra. And then he would give us the beads and tell us what name he's giving us, like that. So uh, what happened was uh, when I got initiated in London, we were about about ten of us got initiation. I got initiation the same day as Subhak Swami. Subhak Swami, you know him? Bingo. Subhak Swami, he joined in London. You know, his, his family had sent him to England because when he was in Calcutta, he's from Calcutta, when he was in India, he was associating with sadhus. So they wanted to get him away from the sadhus. They were worried he might become, a, you know, a monk or something. So they sent him to England. So he went to England and he met the devotees. <laughs> and very early on, he, he joined, before I joined, he was already a devotee. I remember when I joined the movement, I thought, oh, this is interesting. Even an Indian person has joined here. <laughs> Of course, nowadays practically everybody's Indian, <laughs> you know. But in those days, he was the only one there, you know. He was the only Indian. All the rest were Westerners. So Subhag was there and he had become devotee. And Mahavishnu Swami was also there. He was also joined. 
he had also joined. He was very, always very f happy, jovial, wonderful devotee. And so we we had very nice uh, devotees in those days. We were we were very poor. We could never pay the rent even. <laughs> And we used to beg most of the boga for the for the worship, and to be able to get fruit every afternoon, we had to offer fruits to Radha Landaneshwara. There'd be no money, so we have to sell a book. You have to sell a book to get some money <laughs> to to be able to buy fruits to make the offering to offer to the deities. So like that, we were living from day to day. So I was thinking, how long can this go on, you know? <laughs> I don't think this can last very long. <laughs> but somehow, you know, 50 years later, you know, <laughs> everything still going on, bigger and bigger. Everything has expanded by Prabhupada's special potency. Prabhupada taught us, yoga kshima vahamya. Uh, uh, what? Yoga Krishna said, I carry what you lack, I preserve what you have. Yoga Kshema Vahamiyaham. I carry what you lack. I provide what you So Krishna was taking care. Somehow we were able to survive so many struggles in the beginning. But because we kept faith in Prabhupada, we were. And, and Prabhupada taught us. He said, whenever our movement is threatened, he said, you just have to very strictly follow the principles and chant m at least 16 rounds. And if Prabhupada even got sick, we'd stay up the whole night and do kirtan all night for Prabhupada. We wouldn't sleep. We'd spend the whole night with the deities doing kirtan for Prabhupada. We wanted so much. We'd do 24-hour kirtan for Prabhupada's health, to keep Prabhupada with us. So Prabhupada's with us today also. Prabhupada said, I live forever by my books, and my followers live with me. So we're remembering Srila Prabhupada today on this auspicious day, Guru Purnima. Today is also the disappearance day of Srila Sanatana Goswami, who was the head of the Goswamis, Vrindavan. He had given up everything to go to join Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. He was serving the Nawab Hussein Shah. Uh, he was a minister in the government. He had great wealth. He gave it all up to go and live in Vrindavan. And he wrote wonderful books about Krishna consciousness. Today is also the first day of Chaturmasya. We're beginning Chaturmasya. All initiated devotees, we all have to follow Chaturmasya. It's not just for sannyasis. Anyway, Prabhupada has made it not very strict. What we have to do, no green leafy vegetables, right? It means no sak, especially sak, spinach. That's what we're, that's the first month. The second month means no yogurt. Third month, no milk, and the fourth month, no urda, right? No idli and dosa. Oh, <laughs> big problem, huh? That's the real austerity. No idli dosa. Mm. So you have to remember. Okay, thank you very much. Any questions? Anybody wants to ask about Prabhupada or anything? Anyone? Hare Krishna Maharaj, Dadot Pranams. In the beginning of the class, you mentioned about the sloka from 10th canto of Srimad Bhagavatam, wherein it is mentioned if Krishna especially favors somebody, he will take away all their opulence. Is it a, is it a rule or an exception? Because uh, many devotees in Balram Desh, they are doing quite uh, well materially also. So are we to conclude that we are not favored by Krishna Maharaj? Well, it's not. It is not necessary for everybody it's going to happen like that. But in some cases where Lord Krishna considers that this person, if I take away their opulence and put them into a helpless condition, they'll become more attached to Krishna. 
So if the if the person can become more attached to Krishna, then Krishna may do it like that. If Krishna feels that this person can do great service for me, by if I take away his opulence, it will help him to give more service, to do greater service for Krishna. So then it's a good thing. He he takes it away. He takes away the opulence to give more. I was telling Prabhupada gave up one family. He got a huge family. He got a family all over the world. He didn't just have one little house in Calcutta. He had homes all over the world. And he had children who loved him more than his own children. So Krishna takes away to give you more, not to give you less. He's going to give you more. Don't worry. <laughs> You get more in the end, you see? You want. <laughs> but it will be in Krishna's service. It will be connected to Krishna. So that is the main point. Not that in every case it has to be like that. You know, if you're already Krishna conscious, if you're already using everything for Krishna, then it's not a problem. I was telling, Prabhupada was thinking, I'll make money, but Krishna wanted more than just some money. Krishna wanted Prabhupada to give his full energy to write his books and to preach. He didn't just want some money. Okay. Hare Krishna. Any other question? Okay. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Srila Prabhupada. Ki Jai. Your Holiness, Bhakta Bhigna Binasak Narasimha Swami Maharaj ki, Srila Prabhupada ki. So from uh, tomorrow, coming three days, there will be class in Gopal Krishna Temple Kanu Garden, Maharaj class. So here there will be no class. Uh, so